thank you all very much for coming here bright and early on a Monday morning. Um, we're delighted to welcome Liz Truss, MP, Parliamentary Under Secretary for Education and Childcare. Uh, Liz Truss has a responsibility for a huge area of work, including, of course, in the early years sector, uh, but also she has responsibility for assessment, for qualifications, for curriculum form, uh, behaviour and attendance, and school food. And, of course, as you'll all know, has a particular interest in the topic of maths. Uh, she is co-founder of the Free Enterprise Group of Maths, and before entering Parliament in 2010, she was Deputy Director for another think tank who I can't remember the name of, uh, but uh, I'm, sure they weren't, I'm sure they weren't anywhere near as important. Uh, we also have an expert panel here who are going to respond to the Minister. So coming from the sort of the furthest left round to the right, uh, we have Sir Jim Rose. Uh, Jim Rose, renowned educationalist, former Director of Inspections at Ofsted, one of the three wise men from the 1991 report into primary teaching, uh, and of course author of two independent government reports into primary, uh, and of course the Rose Review in the Teaching of Early Years in 2006. Next to him, we have Panima Tanaku, who is Chief Executive of the National Day Nurseries Association, a national charity promoting good practice in the independent sector, including from private, voluntary and independent sector providers, uh, representing over 15,000 nurseries and 250,000 early years staff. Next to her, we have Amanda Timberg. Amanda is the Executive Director of Programmes at Teach First, uh, responsible for all elements of Teach First work, including, of course, their expansion into the primary sector, uh, and an alumnus of Teach for America herself. And then finally, uh, last but not least, we have Max Gregory. Max is a Teach First teacher in the Early Years Foundation stage at Napier Community Primary and Nursery School, and is a passionate advocate of the importance of high-quality teaching at all levels of education, which is always good to hear from a teacher. Um, <laughs> It's obviously a very, very topical time for early years. Uh, Sir Michael Wilshaw's speech last week and Ofsted's first uh, annual report into the early years setting had some typically robust conclusions and recommendations into the various ways that he and Ofsted believe the early years sector should be improved. Uh, it's also an area that policy exchange has written quite a lot about uh, and people will have picked up copies of our reports at the back of the room uh, and if not, please feel free to take them away. Uh, and we are looking forward immensely to continuing the debate further on, including through the Minister's speech here today. Uh, so the Minister's going to speak for about 30 minutes, then we're going to have uh, brief responses from the panel, and then we'll go into a moderated Q&A at the end. Uh, but without any further ado, I'd like to welcome Liz Truss. Well, thank you very much, uh, Jonathan, for hosting this event. And after Policy Exchange put out a report last year demanding an early years pupil premium and teach first to, for the early years. I knew that I could only come back to policy exchange if I delivered on both of these things. So it was close, but it was few where we managed to get both of them through. So uh, I'm pleased to be back here. To misquote Beatrice and Sidney Webb, I've seen the future and it's in Bolton. A couple of weeks ago, I went on a whirlwind tour with Jack Hatch of the St. Bede's Academy Group around his various operations in the Northwest. I visited the Little Rainbows Nursery in Lee, which is a day nursery, a baby bead in Bolton, another PVI nursery. They operate in tandem with St. Bede's School Nursery. Jack also has a nursery in Wigan. He's opening a childminder agency in Bolton this September. And he's also talking of expanding one of his nurseries to become a primary school. There's a comprehensive training programme for all of the team who positively burst with enthusiasm when you meet them about working in this fantastic organisation. Parents have flexibility of slots between 7.30 in the morning and 6 in the evening. They can take their free entitlement of 15 hours a week or they can have full-time care. All of Jack's operations are either good or Ofsted outstanding. In fact, most of them are outstanding. And parents paying for the extra hours pay less than two-thirds of the cost of an average place for childcare in the northwest of England. I think this is a fantastic example of the kind of practice we want to see, sharing between private providers, maintained sector providers, offering good value for money and high-quality teacher-led care. At a recent cross-government meeting, I was asked on early years, what does success look like? At the moment, we have an 18-month gap between children on low incomes and children on high incomes when they enter school. What success looks, is, looks like is simple. Success looks like no gap at all. Now, this is possible. We can see that other countries are much closer 
to that objective than we are. And that is what we are working on. As Sir Michael Wilshaw said last week, many children enter formal schooling already behind. Once behind, their disadvantage often becomes entrenched. But there is nothing inevitable about the link between poverty and failure. And that's why, as a government, we've been working to get rid of the unnecessary red tape, prescription and bureaucratic box ticking. Because what we know that matters is the outcomes for children. It's not about how full your sandpit is, which is what one nursery reported to me as an issue that had been identified, or exactly how you filled in your learning journey, or whether or not you're operating a structured teacher-led placement or free flow of children. It's the outcomes that matter. And as the Chief Inspector said, for too long, we've been stuck with an alphabet soup of terminology. A child is a child. Whether or not they come from wealth or poverty, they need the same nurture, love and learning in the early years. A teacher is a teacher, regardless of whether they're teaching a 14-year-old the cosine role or they're helping a three-year-old speak in full sentences. Now, of course, teaching in the early years needs to be age appropriate. Sir Michael Wilshaw rightly highlighted that when parents count the stairs as they carry their child to bed, when they read a toddler's stories or sing nursery rhymes, when they guide them so that they can play well with other children, all of that is teaching. And this is what happens in high quality nurseries. It's not about starting school at an early age. That is not what we are talking about. And no one believes that. Nobody in this debate believes that. It's all about developing the language, communication and social skills so that children can learn when they are at school. Those are two very different things. And as I've said, success needs to be judged on the outcomes. Now, previously, we've had a system where providers have been judged differently. So those on the earliest registers have had a different set of objectives from those schools providing nursery care. I don't think that's right. And I'm pleased that there will now be a level playing field. And I say to nurseries and childminders, whether you're in the state or private or voluntary sector, whether you're in a school or in a chain, whether you're in an agency or whether you're independent, what matters is that you provide safe and high quality childcare that meets the needs of all children and doesn't allow any to fall behind. We value the important work you do equally. And in future, everyone will be held to account on the same basis. I do agree with Sir Michael that some of the best quality early education can be found in schools. We know from the EPI study and numerous other studies that the best outcomes are in teacher-led care. And we know that in deprived areas, 41% of the staff in school nurseries are teachers, which compares to only 10% in private nurseries. So we know that there is a gap. Of course, all of those teachers need high quality staff working with them. And one of the things I observed at St Bede's is how they all feel that they're part of a team. It's not just about having teachers, but it is important that there is strong leadership from teachers. Now, to listen to some of the debate last week, you'd think that school nurseries were a new invention. In fact, the first school nursery was opened by 1823. And the Butler Education Act in 1944 made it clear that nursery schools or nursery classes in schools should be available for all parents that want them. So we have a long and proud history of good quality school nurseries and nursery schools. And if you look at the situation today, a third of early years places are in schools. And in some London boroughs, it's over 80% of places. I think the issue has been because schools are on a different register from private and voluntary sector nurseries, people aren't necessarily aware of the existence of such a large uh, group of early education. For too long, it's been difficult for schools to open new nursery provision and to provide the flexibility that modern families need. 
Some local authorities have said, we already have enough places in our borough and have blocked schools and other providers from opening new nurseries. The vast majority of school nurseries offer only a standard 9 to 12 or 12 to 3 slot. That's not easy for a parent who works two days a week or works shifts, <coughs> who's trying to combine childcare with work or other commitments. So we've made it the case that every school, whether it's a local authority, an academy or a free school, and also independent schools also offer places, they can now lower the age range to cater for three and four-year-olds without having to go through a legal process or submit a burdensome business case. And they can open a nursery for the whole day from eight to six. Under this government, every school in the country has given, been given the power to open a nursery. And that means that school nurseries can offer the free 15 hours of care flexibly for parents. For example, offering three five-hour slots to suit a part-time job. And I know that Little Rainbows in Lee offers a deal for parents at that nursery, giving them the free hours plus lunch for an extra £1.40, which is an affordable proposition for many parents. And I enjoyed eating uh, the Lancashire pasties and vegetables as well uh, when I was there. But it does show that school nurseries and private nurseries who think about it can offer really good packages for parents of all types, whether they're parents who are just taking the 15 hours or parents who are working part-time or full-time. And we've also enabled school nurseries to extend their provision to two-year-olds so they can allow parents to use their funded flexibility within that. But we also want to see more great quality private and voluntary sector nurseries as well. I'm sure Panema will point out that quality is improving. And I recognise the efforts of providers to increase the level of qualifications amongst their staff. In fact, one of the most heartening things I get in my post bag is letters from early years teachers and those training to be early years teachers, really demonstrating their commitment uh, to improving their own qualifications and improving the work they do. And we do want to see good quality private providers expand. We're removing planning restrictions, which are one of the biggest headaches facing providers who want to set up from scratch or expand their premises. As of yesterday, it will be quicker, simpler and cheaper for nurseries to open in buildings not currently used for childcare. So, for example, nurseries will be able to convert an office without planning applications having to be put in. This will mean it's easier for businesses who want to offer creche facilities for their staff or nursery facilities for their staff. And if high quality providers, private providers want to expand by delivering more funded early education places, we've made that easier too. Previously, they would have to have a separate check from the local authority. Now, if you're a good or outstanding provider, you can automatically offer those funded places. Last week's report by Ofsted was a first. It was the first time that school nurseries, private nurseries and childminders were brought together under one roof. Previously, they were seen as separate, but I am very firmly of the view that the early years are better together. We want to see teachers and nurseries in the driving, street, driving seat sorry, of improvement. As we see in schools, we want strong providers working with weaker providers to improve practice in a school-led system. We've already got a network of teaching schools, but we want them to play a much larger role in the early years, and we insist that they reach out to all providers. Some are already doing this brilliantly. I've mentioned some beads several times, but in Bristol, uh, a consortium of three nursery schools were awarded teaching school designation last year. And they work closely with primary teaching schools in their area, with local colleges and universities. And the lead teachers in that organisation are drawn from private and voluntary sector providers, as well as being drawn from the nursery schools. They provide training and support packages. And over 800 practitioners benefited last year, helping close the gap in early years outcomes in Bristol. We now have over 100 teaching schools with nurseries and over 1,000 more schools with nurseries formally linked to teaching schools alliances. And we have 16 nursery schools who are teaching schools. But we want to strengthen these links even further and make them more widely available. 
So I'm delighted to announce that 20 teaching schools are establishing new links with early years providers in their area. And we're also working with closely with organisations like the NDNA to share the best ways of deploying teachers, whether or not the nursery is in a school or run by a private provider. And a number of very helpful case studies have been produced in conjunction with the NDNA about the best way of deploying teaching staff. Working together, driving up standards together, and building a self-improving system from children from birth right through to 18, led by teaching schools and nurseries. That is how we see the future. And we don't just want schools and nurseries to lead training and support. We also want you to develop the next generation of early years teachers. And I can announce that we're extending School Direct to the early years for the first time, meaning that nurseries will have the ability to train early years teachers of what I call the Play-Doh face. At a first stage, I'm sorry, it was a lame pun. At, at a first stage, 59 School Direct early years places have been allocated for September 2014 to six early years teaching schools and to the large nursery chain Bright Horizons. So that's a shared project across the maintained and private sector. If it works out as well as we hope, and the school direct is working very well in schools, next year will be bigger and better, and I want more schools and nurseries to get involved. This is a fundamental part of a teacher-led self-improving system, putting you in charge of developing the next generation of talent. One of the most important ways we drive up standards is, of course, to increase the supply of high-quality teachers. And we're determined to help those nurseries who don't have highly qualified teachers. And I know some nurseries struggle to recruit. We want to give you the support you need to do that. That's why we've improved specialist training for early years teachers. There are now the same rigorous entry requirements as there are to be a primary school teacher. And we've seen a 25% increase in places this year because of high demand from students. We're offering generous bursaries and we're giving incentives of £14,000 per trainee to employers who support their graduate staff getting trained. And we're also offering bursaries of £3,000 for top quality apprentices to train as early years educators. The other way to bring the best graduates into the early years is through Teach First. And I'm glad we've got an example with us here today. So we had 16 recruits last year starting a two-year training program. And I met one of the recruits at the Oasis Academy in Hadley, a marine biologist, but he was spending his time talking about a train set and playing with it with a group of two-year-olds. And I think these people will help provide early years with passionate, dedicated ambassadors and leaders for the future. And I'm delighted to say we're expanding the program this year to 50 uh, more Teach First in the Early Years placements. And obviously, we want to expand that even more in the future. Last week, Sir Michael Wilshaw set us a challenge as a government about our funding of the early years, about the two-year-old offer, about the regulation and legislation that underlies our programme. We've committed on the tax-free child care programme to provide up to £2,000 per child for support for the under fives and over fives. And we're also, through universal credit, going to be paying eight, up to 85% of childcare costs for those on the lowest incomes. More than 100,000 two-year-olds from a low-income background are now in high-quality places, thanks to the two-year-old program. And our early years pupil premium, which is 500 million for 2015-16, will we'll keep the link going between those two-year-olds entering the two-year-old programme and then pupil premium in schools, which is being successful at helping those from the lowest income backgrounds do better at school. We're also working to make the system much simpler, much easier to understand for parents and much easier for people in different parts of early years to work together. We want to see quality while keeping prices in line with what parents can afford. I'm pleased to say that contrary to a lot of uh, popular view, costs are stabilising. For the first time in 12 years, the costs of childcare in England are falling after taking into account inflation. So if we care, 
compare, for example, the cost of nursery places for two, three and four-year-olds, they were flat in England, where they rose by 8% in Scotland and 13% in Wales. We know that quality is rising and an immense amount of effort is going into improving practice by all providers and using our money more efficiently and more effectively. But there is still further to go. As Michael Wilshaw said, the most important measure of success in early years is whether the poorest children are doing as well as their better off peers by the time they start school. Then there should be no more gap. There should be no more five-year-olds already 18 months behind in the future. And that is why we need a teacher-led, self-improving system which is judged on its outcomes. By working together, we can achieve it and eliminate the gap for good. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Minister. Now we go to immediate responses. Sir Jim. Right, I'll try to speak without hesitation or repetition for just a minute, and that's going to be very hard for me, I can tell you. Um, I, let's start where I think um, you know, I declare my interest. I think this is probably one of the most remarkable uh, sets of policy, if you like, that we've seen in recent times. And it could have a transforming effect on all that follows. There's no doubt uh, that you know, we're all aiming for the same goals. And in fact, it seems to me the problem for a long time, as in early years, has been uh, diversity of provision and we haven't had the unity of purpose that that's really required. So that, that would be an issue which I think will be high on this agenda and we would look for signs that we're actually closing that gap in all forms of provision that, that exist. But it must be right, mustn't it, to take the line that poverty is not destiny. Uh, they're not my words, they come from the OECD as you well know. And we should work hard at that. Uh, to try and bring about all the outcomes that have been so graphically described. The news, uh, which I hadn't fully appreciated, is that quality is rising. Um, I think we should build on that, and the building of bridges, quite honestly, is going to be of paramount importance. Um, I do think, however, that we delude ourselves if we think this isn't going to be a long and hard slog, because uh, it is extremely demanding and there will be capacity problems. I really embrace the arrangements and actually the hopes for getting a better trained workforce. Who could say nay to that? Um, and most certainly, you know, the whole business of actually moving forward on a model like the Bolton model uh, is, is really exciting. The question is, how can we scale it up and how can we scale it up quickly? So, um, I think there will be problems. I think some of them will be problems of legacy. I mean, this is a very interesting area that sometimes has been detached from the rest of education because of the different sets of objectives that have occasionally clashed. And we often get into a terribly sterile debate, it seems to me, about fake opposites. A bit of a besetting sin of English education. Trads v. Trendies, formal v. informal, child-centered subject centers, I teach children, not subject and so on. But the worst of all is this business of it's too much too soon. I and mean, these sort of cliches take off before we have a chance to really examine them. And for the children that we're concerned about most, it seems to me that too little too late is probably a bigger risk than too much too soon. And with that, my couple of minutes are up. <laughs> Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you, Matthew. Um, I think, uh, you know, if last Thursday is anything to go by in terms of the media marathon, which is what I would call I started my day at half past five in the morning and finished at about one o'clock in the afternoon. I think what was really clear is that the messages that are actually coming out of some of these uh, kind of policy decisions, and I'm really delighted that the earliest people's premium has been announced because actually that is something NDNA has been campaigning for for a long time. But I think we need to really redefine some of these messages because from parents' point of view, actually, you know, they feel as if that kind of randomly, radically changing the goalpost isn't actually helping them in terms of understanding exactly what it means to them in terms of quality. When I was sat in the, the Radio 4 uh, room with John Humphreys and Evan Davies, they were doing a live poll 
and with parents. And of course, 92% of the parents actually were disagreeing with two years old, two year olds in schools. But actually, that was the message that went out. I'm really delighted that actually Liz clarified a number of things today in terms of actually the mixed economy, because what we're not talking about is actually, uh, is, you know, either are, what we must be very careful about putting those messages actually we are talking about really helping and supporting those uh, from the deprived areas who are actually really struggling but equally those providers are equally struggling because we don't have a level playing field at the moment and I think that was something that we need to be really be very clear about and also in terms of those messages to parents what do we mean by quality what do we mean by two-year-olds in schools or nurseries in schools what do we actually mean by teaching in early years. I think they really haven't got that message at all yet. I think that's something the government and the sector needs to really work together to really clarify and unveil some of those messages in terms of parents because actually it's a very confusing picture for a parent. And, and I think the, the other thing I just wanted to very quickly highlight is actually any support with workforce uh, and, and any support with raising the bar on uh, qualifications and, and that status of early years is absolutely welcome. But what we need to absolutely make sure is we need to clear, create that level playing field at a quality level with Ofsted, at funding level in terms of on par with schools and on different levels because I think you know when we did our research and recently published it, uh, providers have said they're limiting the number of two-year-old places that they, they can offer on average to 11. Why? Because they can't afford to make any more losses than they're already making. So I think that that's a real message because it's not because the PVI sector doesn't want to deliver, not because the PVI sector doesn't have the, the, the kind of uh, required quality they have, believe me, they've been doing it for a number of years. So it's not a either our message, it's how can we work together. In the same survey, 42% of the providers said they are actually working in partnership with schools. I think those are the messages that we need to give out, is actually everybody working together to really achieve those best outcomes for children. Great, thank you. Amanda. Thanks, Jonathan. Share? Yeah, I mean, as an independent charity whose whole vision is a gap that doesn't exist between low-income and high-income um, children, I think, as, as Jim was saying, this is something that really does have the potential to be really transformative. And for us, um, the idea that life chances are um, stifled at such a young age because of the lack of um, opportunity that exists for the youngest children is something that we're really passionate about as well. Uh, we started out at secondary. We now have had primary teachers through Teach First for about five years. And last year, uh, we started putting some teachers in early year settings. Max will tell you more about it. He's in a school down in, in Kent. But uh, what's really powerful for us is understanding how those gaps just get wider and wider and wider. And uh, I know Max and I both, I, I taught primary, have had that experience of children coming into your classroom um, who can't identify letters and sounds. And for me, it was seven-year-olds. So um, for us, having a three to seven PGCE, which is the qualification Max is working towards, is a really powerful development. And one, one thing that's quite unique about this route that Teach First has in early years is that there is a formal requirement that they spend time in a zero to three setting as well um, to really ensure that they have that sense of um, what is required in terms of the emotional, social, well-being, uh, in terms of understanding child development and getting the right skills for that setting. Mm -hmm. um, so we're really pleased that these initiatives are trying and hopefully succeeding to attract more, more high quality workforce um, into the sector. And with School Direct, we have seen a really positive impact of that. Um, in primary and secondary, so we, we welcome that as well. And I was really uh, struck by the, the local teaching school alliances because more and more this school-led system and teacher-led system is providing these green shoots and these proof points for us to see what can really make a difference. And we're really keen to work at that local level, um, thinking about not just across the early years, which I, I think is, is fantastic, but there's so much to learn at, at every age range from each other. And, uh, you know, too many times we sort of silo these sectors and we don't realize that you can be 16 years old, you still, your emotional and social well-being is still absolutely crucial. So the ability for these local areas to learn from each other, um, we have 12 head teachers now through Teach First and two of them actually look after primary provision and nursery because they're in all through settings. We have seen a lot of success with those as well. So um, for us, you know, we just really hope this is another positive step along that journey of creating that parity and that high quality workforce that, that goes all the way from the youngest children all the way through to, to university. Great. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Great. And Matt, you got the Play-Doh face. Okay, I'm <laughs> the Play-Doh face. Um, <laughs> I'm only seven months into my teaching career, so I thought maybe I'd talk a little bit more about why it's important. Um, when I applied to Teach First, I applied for secondary politics in the North East, and I was given uh, early years in the South East, and I wasn't, I wasn't very pleased. Um, and I can't tell you how glad I am I didn't get what I wanted, because early years where it all starts, uh, if, you, if you get the start of the race right, then you, you're going to get the finish right. You can see the biggest impact there. You can see the biggest change. I, um, I had a boy who came to me in <laughs> September, and every day for the first term, he kicked and cried and screamed and shouted and would sit in the middle of my floor and just scream for the first 50 minutes of the lesson. It's tricky trying to teach a lesson in your first month of teaching when everyone's screaming. Um, and in December, his mum came to me with a post note that he'd written um, that said, I love school. And that's, that's what you can do in early years. You can turn someone who hates school or hates education or hates learning into someone who loves it. And if they leave me or they leave a, a, a nursery loving learning at three or four or five, then they're more likely to love it when they're 10 and they're more likely to love it when they're 15. And if they love it, then they're going to want to do it. And if they want to do it, then they'll succeed. That's, for me, that, that's the heart of it. That's, that's what we can do here. So, I mean, I might not know much, but I do know that the better early years teacher you have, the better your children are going to do. So I'm really pleased with your announcement today that we're going to get more high quality teachers and more high quality practitioners into an early year setting. I think that's brilliant. I think that with a new pupil premium, if I can spend that money on getting my children who come in only speaking Turkish and not speaking a word of English, communicating with their peers when they leave me, or if I can buy in some specialist counselling support for the children under my care who really, really need that extra time to just talk, and then they're ready when they move to year one to access a curriculum without having anger problems or problems at home that they're unable to deal with, and, that, and that's only a good thing. Um, there's a saying in schools that's keep up is better than catch up. And I think that the policies we've heard today will really help that. They're not going to give every child from 0 to 18 an excellent education, but they're going to help it make sure that when they leave me at five, we're not already <coughs> playing catch-up. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Let's open it up to Q&A. If you could say who you are and who you're representing, please, <coughs> and then if we can have brief questions rather than uh, long speeches or statements, that would be fantastic. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's fun. Yeah. Uh, Elaine Simpson, I'm chair of the. Oh, thank you. Elaine Simpson, I'm chair of the board of trustees for the National Children's Bureau, and I, I think that's fabulous what's been set out here, and, and the ambition that people start off, you know, that, that we ensure that there are no gaps at five is fantastic. My worry is that I don't know that that'll ever be achieved whilst we've still got such an equity between naught and two, and I think what you've set out is brilliant, but is there nothing that we can do? to support parents and carers in understanding better how their child learns, how to play with them. I can never understand why the Department of Health spends a fortune on offering everybody free courses in how to breathe during childbirth, which every mother here will tell you doesn't help at all. And <laughs> nobody, but nobody seems to make it very easily available to find out how to play with your child. Um, I think, well, first of all, I agree with you about the breathing. <laughs> um, <laughs> not to is extremely important we are doing a lot I mean it's not something I particularly covered in today's speech because people tell me if you try and say too many things in a speech people don't hear <laughs> any of it so we are working very closely with the Department of Health we've got the joint check coming in in 2015 um, one of the key points is children's centres and one of the points that Michael Wilshaw made in his report, which I didn't cover, is that we are moving towards a different type of inspection regime for children's centres, which is really holding local authorities to account on how well they are providing support to parents, and particularly support to the most disadvantaged parents in those early years. Because ultimately, the money for early intervention goes through the Department of Local Government. It's a local government responsibility. And they have the ability, with things like the health, health and wellbeing boards being devolved locally, they have the ability to actually really help those families in the early years of life. And we've got some fantastic examples. For example, Havering Council are working very closely with... They've integrated with their Troubled Families programme uh, to make sure those parents are getting support. We've got some very good examples in Manchester. Um, our 
integrating their children's centre services exactly as you say with health services. So antenatal care, postnatal care, birth registration all takes place there. We have the Early Intervention Foundation doing research on what works best and there are some very good programmes like Five to Thrive uh, which is used in Hertfordshire which is exactly the kind of messages to parents uh, that you're talking about, about talking, reading, cuddling, playing, all those really important things. But that's, it's a great, ultimately that has to happen on a local level. It's about high quality practitioners in children's centres and in health services doing, doing that work. But we are working on it. Can I say, just memory um, and age helps a bit. I mean, I recall PEEP, right? Um, and you, you will know all about that, which was the Parents Early Education Partnership, which started off in Oxford, targeting the most deprived youngsters in that area and their families, naught to whatever. And it, I sat through several sessions of, of their work, uh, really quite remarkable. And often we forget those things. Um, you know, we, we have done well, spectacularly well, in some very small pockets. I don't know what's happened to Peep since then, but it's it would be existence. very still goes. I, yes, I, under, I you know I understand that. And this is what the Early Intervention Foundation is looking at rolling out those type of programs Excellent. more I nationally. Mean, I, so. so I do think we have experience of success, and I think we ought to just remind ourselves yeah. just how effective it is. Okay, great. Another question. Yes, just in the front here. Uh, Stuart Leeming, CEO of New Islington Free School Trust and the Children of Success School Trust, which is a multi-academy trust, uh, both operating in uh, deprived areas of Manchester. Mm -hmm. um, New Islington Free School is uh, in its first year of opening at the moment and about to move into uh, permanent premises. And from the outset, there has been very strong demand from our community for uh, early years provision. Um, until recently, of course, we haven't been able to uh, provide that. Um, as, as we now are able to uh, tap into funding, um, is there also going to be capital funding available? Because to provide the uh, facility, we need to either acquire premises or to extend our building. Good question. It, it is a good question. I'm in discussions with Lord Nash about that at the moment. Um, the, and... Okay, the, there is an element of we want to be fair to PVI providers as well, who also have to fund the capital through their income. Um, we've got some very good models of schools that have successfully done that. They've successfully raised finance or done it in different ways. I'd be very happy to share that with you. But I know that in terms of the regulatory hurdles, schools are able to lower their age range. They don't need to ask for permission. Uh, they can do that, so it is possible to do that. Capital funding, it's a matter for Lord Nash, but I'm sure he will listen. Put in, how does the PBI set to find capital? Yeah, I think uh, it's extremely difficult at the moment because uh, in terms of to raise capital to either expand or to actually create new places or even to kind of add another room, it's a, it's a mammoth task, especially for small providers, especially in, in sort of, you know, uh, deprived communities. By the way, that, that there is this myth that PBI sector doesn't actually operate in deprived communities is absolutely wrong because actually 30% of our members are actually already working in those deprived communities and they are the ones who are set up by women mainly because they couldn't find uh, adequate quality childcare for their own children and actually have uh, been running their businesses. I think what banks are asking for, because we actually work with uh, a number of investors in, in this area, <coughs> banks are asking for is a, is a three-year business plan with a number of uh, you know, children who will be coming through those doors and exactly the, what funding levels that they will be getting. And I think you know, it's extremely difficult because you, know, you only need a complaint triggered inspection in a, in a PVI setting to actually get downgraded from outstanding to satisfactory. Immediately, you've lost funding. One nursery in a really good quality, high, highly you know, uh, sort of, you know, qualified staff, outstanding nursery, lost 30,000 pounds through three-year or four-year-old funding alone. They're not going to sustain. They're not going to survive. So we have got all these challenges in terms of uh, investment back 
that it is extremely difficult to raise capital, uh, you know, especially for smaller settings in terms of, uh, you know, uh, expansion. And that's where really uh, they need the support because you've got to increase utilities bills, VAT, because immediately the PBR sector will have to pay for VAT as soon as they expand. So that adds on top of their cost. So all these issues uh, are the ones that where we need the level playing field. I just wanted to point two things out. First of all, there is a strong opportunity for collaboration with schools. A lot of the cases I mentioned, like the Sabeeds case, is where you have PVI providers operating on school sites, collaborating with schools. There are a lot of opportunities there. But secondly, that's the whole point of our planning reforms as well, is to enable PVI providers to convert commercial facilities and offices into nurseries without planning permission. Because a lot of nursery chains have complained to me just the harassment factor of going through planning permission. So it does make it easier to convert things like community buildings, offices into nurseries, which is quite easily, well, you know, it's a relatively easy proposition. I mean, it's the planning that has been the big problem. So, you know, we'd all like more, you know, finances, but we are trying to make it as easy as possible for good quality providers to expand. Can I just pick up on that point? I think uh, what's really important is actually the schools don't need to reinvent the wheel and re-establish earliest provision. What they really should be looking at is actually, this is exactly what happened in the beginning, early stages of children's centres, because children's centres were built right next door to mm. existing high quality provision, which made it absolutely impossible for them to sustain and survive. So I think what, as a first port of call, what schools need to do is actually see how they can commission the earliest provision, either on their premises, actually the PBI sector delivering that, or actually nearby, I think that's really best of both worlds to be able to get that expertise and equally to be able to actually share that kind of resources and, uh, and, and then the knowledge. Great, thank you. Uh, questions? Uh, lady right at the back. Dini Beutro from ICANN. Um, Minister and everyone else, this really is a welcome set of developments and I echo uh, Jim, your comment that this is a sector that's needed uni unity of purpose around closing the gap. And so Michael Wilshaw's speech the other day and this, this one I think gives us that. Two related questions. Um, ICANN runs surveys of the children's workforce, the earliest workforce, that persistently show that the workforce is underconfident in speech, language, and communication development. The, one of the key areas of gap identified by Ofsted. And I'm hoping that underneath some of the very welcome points about uh, improving the quality of the workforce, this, this can be addressed specifically. Second question is, ICANN runs two outstanding Ofsted-rated, non-maintained special schools that have found it very difficult to engage in their local teaching school networks. Now that we've got more diversity of supply and a level playing field, I really hope that can be addressed too. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So, special schools and uh, workforce. Should we take a manual on that? Do you want to talk about workforce at all? And do, you think, do you think workforce being underconfident in, in speech and language therapy, is that an issue that you see particularly? Um, I think Obviously, it's, it's going to be very setting dependent. We uh, at Napier have a, a really high quality speech and language TA who worked with me a lot at the beginning to make sure my confidence levels were up because that is a really important thing that the, the main way the children access the curriculum is through listening, understanding and speaking. Um, so I think it, it probably cuts the heart of a larger issue is that making sure schools and providers are providing good ongoing training for their staff, teachers or otherwise who, who come into the environments and making sure that you're constantly evaluating where your staff are and what they need to do to progress. Um, I think that's something you need to look at particularly in the earlier. Sometimes that can be a problem in school settings that the school professional development program is more geared towards the primary sector um, and that, that's something that is probably really important to look at. Well, I, mean, I think that sort of raises a very interesting question that we're all concerned about. I, I can, I think, is doing remarkable work in actually proving, as it were, the links between speaking, listening, reading, and writing. There's no doubt that reading and writing feed, reading and writing feed off speaking and listening. 
And that's now written very solidly into the new curriculum. And I think we should pursue that in this area for all it's worth. Because if there's one thing we can do to change the game, it's to boost children's vocabulary, particularly those yeah. youngsters who are actually uh, from the poorest circumstances. And we should go for that. I was going to suggest that that's you know, really uh, perhaps a first target for unifying the whole of the sector. So, yeah, I mean, I think um, it's a real question. It's really good to hear that you're getting pretty satisfying um, input on all of that. Well, completely agree with Jim about vocabulary. I mean, it's the lots of research that shows it's the number one factor in children's ability to read later on is a broad vocabulary. And the, the difference in vocabulary between those on a low in, from a low-income background and high-income background is one of the key drivers of the gap. Um, the, the new early years teacher qualification, it contains a lot of work on speech and language for precisely that reason. <coughs> and you know, on the subject of teaching school networks, Charlie Taylor is responsible overall for teaching schools. He's very engaged in this whole area. He's passionate about a 0 to 18 system without silos. And he's, I'm sure he'd be very happy to sort of look at that specific issue uh, you've raised. But the teaching, in my view, teaching school networks have to be open to all the providers who, and, and providers have to feel part of it. And that's why I'm so delighted in cases like Bristol that you've actually got specialist leaders of education from the PVI sector and from schools who all feel part of it and it's a self-improving process and that's very, very important. Great. Thank John, you very much. Can I ask Sorry, yeah, um, just in terms of the importance of, of the parental link, and I think it goes back to the very first question about not to two, because actually, the, the, as we've all said, the kind of particularly speaking and listening in terms of being critical early skills to access all those other pre-literacy numeracy skills come down really to, to how the parents are engaging with, with the children. And you know, it, it's just, I think, critical to think about the role that early years has to play in terms of working yeah. closely with the community and the parents. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, great question, yes. Thank you. My name is Helen Perkins from Solihull College. Um, I'm interested in the, uh, you were talking about your Teach First program, three to seven. I'm assuming that means that those uh, candidates will end up with QTS, not early years teacher. So question is, why is it not 0 to 7? And equally, why do we need a differentiation between an early years teacher and a QTS? I actually know the answer, I think, but um, <laughs> and I guess I'm not the only one by that. Um, so I'd like just to know why we're not having, you know, we've got the same rules, same entry criteria. Why are we not QTS? Okay. Amanda? You know, for us, um, providing a PGCE is one of the things that makes the group very attractive to the types of graduates that we get through Teach First and having parity between the leadership opportunities and the qualifications that you can get at each of those different age phases has been really critical. So Max talked about the fact that he applied to Teach First. When you apply, you apply minimum academic requirements, but it's a competency-based model. And then we look at the areas of the country and we look at where you're best suited to teach and where the need is. Um, I'm going to speak for Max, but I think having that PGCE, which equally leads to um, the ability to get master's level qualifications, et cetera, has been, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to, to offer an early years opportunity without having a three to seven PGCE. Um, what, what I'd say is that, yeah, I've already said this before, but our long-term ambition is to have a single set of qualifications that are age appropriate, but that, you know, are all part of the same framework. Now, we're not there yet. The first step has been equalising the test on entry um, and creating the new early years teacher status. You know, I would absolutely like to see a continuum where, I mean, this is why I made it clear in my speech, I think a teacher is a teacher. They should be equally valued and held in equal esteem uh, throughout the process. Uh, Jonathan and everyone else will be aware there are a lot of reforms going on to teaching at the moment. Um, I am keen to see that, that work through in the long term. In the short term, it hasn't been possible to do that because of the other uh, reforms that are taking place. I wonder if I could just... Please. Um, I think, for me, I, I wouldn't have taken the opportunity to work in early years had that PGCE not been on offer. And I speak for colleagues as well who mm. are looking for, in the longer term, school leadership positions that early years teacher status wouldn't necessarily open up for us. Um, but I would definitely echo the idea that a teacher is a teacher and we should have 
one qualification with a specialty for age appropriateness yep. that runs all the way through because there are, I mean, skills in early years that can work in sixth form just as there are skills in sixth form that can work in early years. There's certain key things that work really well across, the school, across mm -hmm. education in general. Yeah, early years is the only one that has early years teaching. Okay, let's take another question. Uh, gentleman there. Hi, I'm, uh, I'm an architect working with different providers, but also a governor uh, looking to, uh, well, at a school looking to lower the age range. Um, I suppose this is, it's, it's really the question about um, the increase in academies and free schools and um, what impact um, that's actually having on early years provision and also one of accountability being local authorities still have some sort of accountability. Um, well, we're, do we're doing more sort of research on exactly. I mean, our latest figures show overall the, the number of children in school nurseries is rising. Um, I don't have a specific figure on academies and free schools. I mean, in terms of the role of the local authority, it, it's a similar question to what, how the role of the local authority has changed for all schools, which is local authorities have become more of a commissioner, taken more of a strategic role. And I see local, local authorities should be attracting high quality providers into their areas. We've recently released a benchmarking tool which shows the proportion of good and outstanding nurseries in particular local authority areas. And I would suggest everyone has a look at it because it is absolutely stark, the level of difference. And there are some terrible performers and there are some amazing performers. And it doesn't necessarily fit with the level of deprivation, actually. There are... And, and I, I'm very disappointed when I go around and I hear either private providers or schools told me that they haven't been open, able to open a nursery in the area on the grounds that there are enough places already. Yes, that's right. There were 300,000 spare places across the country. That's true. However, what we want is high-quality places. And if the places aren't good enough, then it doesn't matter if they're there already. And what, what we need is to make it much easier for new good providers. And what I would like to see local authorities doing is actually saying, we've got a spare building here. Let's get a good quality nursery to open in this spare building. There's plenty of you know, government buildings are a classic example. There's plenty of government buildings available where good quality nurseries could be open. I mean, this is the, you know, the point about capital. How are we actually using the estates we have uh, at best possible moment? So I see local authorities should be champions of getting high quality providers into their area uh, rather than necessarily seeing their job as to say, well, there's, you know, there's no room at the inn. We've got enough people uh, in our area already. Brina, how do you, how do you that I, I think I, I would agree with you. I think that the roles need to be a little bit more redefined in terms of uh, with all the changes, you know, the, the, there is a mixed economy that exists already. And then on top of that, there is a, an expansion in terms of early years. But what is the role of local authority? What is the role of Ofsted in terms of uh, judging the quality? What are the roles of, in fact, most importantly, the parents and the providers in terms of actually enhancing the quality? I think one thing I just wanted to, to kind of point I want to do highlight is the diversity and equality. What the universal free childcare has done in this country is actually completely create a level playing field for parents, irrespective of their social backgrounds, to be able to access free childcare for 15 hours, wherever they want to access it, unlike in Scotland and Wales, because we need to be proud that in England the parents have that choice, and in Scotland and Wales they don't have the choice. Local authorities decide on which settings are going to be funded for those places. But what it also has created is that the children from the most deprived communities are able to actually mix with children up from all different social backgrounds and all different cultures and that is the most important right. thing what we need to be really careful is actually make sure because children at that age thank god don't know that they belong to a different social background and i think what we need to be really careful is actually not kind of compartmentalize those children so that the, these are the places where the deprived two-year-olds can go to what we need to really encourage is actually a combination of provision that suits the parents' needs and to be able to really uplift it because actually children learn through other children, through play and through interaction with other children. It doesn't matter which background they come from and that's how they learn. And I think it's really important that we actually maintain that and really enhance that. Okay, that's great. Uh, question later in front here. <coughs> 
Roberts, I think we're all agreed on the importance of raising the quality of the workforce. So I'd like to ask the Minister why we've heard through Nursery World recently that the uh, nut brand proposals to raise the minimum qualification for inclusion in ratios to level three appears now to have been abandoned, whether she could say a bit more about that. Well, I don't think there was any, it's not been abandoned so much as, you know, we're not, we're not, um, you know, imposing a requirement on the number of personnel that have level three. What, what we want to do and what Ofsted are do, proposing in their reforms is that we focus on outcomes for children because I think then there needs to be freedom for leaders in, in nurseries to decide what is the best complement of staff for my nursery. The only concrete evidence we've got is actually the EPI study, which shows that the importance of teachers, uh, the importance of graduate level teachers in nurseries, and that's why I've highlighted graduate level teachers as you know, one of the main differentiators at the moment between school nurseries and other, as other, and other nurseries. Of course, if somebody has a level three qualification, we want to make sure it's a high quality level three qualification. That's why we're insisting on GCSE, English and Math to enter the course. But I don't want to restrict nurseries in terms of how exactly they deploy staff. What we want to do is, from this September, Ofsted, for the first time, are finding out what qualifications staff in nurseries have and then we're going to be looking at the outcomes they achieve. I think that's a better way of doing it. I mean, we don't have, for example, in schools, we don't have restrictions on exactly what qualifications teaching uh, assistants have. We, we say that it's up to head teachers to decide what is the best way of achieving positive outcomes. Okay. And then last question, and then we're going to have to wrap it up, please. Gentleman at the back there. Uh, Rafe Lucas, House of Lords, Good Schools Guide. How would you like to measure outcomes? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> uh, let's, let's, let's do the whole panel going down. Sir Jim. <laughs> All right, I'll try not to say pass. Um, <laughs> how would you like to... I tell you what, I, I don't... I, this, we, we need another discussion entirely on this, actually, because I do think it's extremely important. <laughs> But I mean, I just want to draw attention to what I thought was a really interesting report recently, and it's entitled Baby Bonds, Parenting, Attachment and a Secure Base for Children. I thought it was all about selling ISIS for infants when I first read it. But it is extremely insightful in, in, in many respects, because it does reveal the kind of outcomes that we should be looking for on that side of interrelationships and all the rest of it. School parents, child parents, and parent and so on and so forth. So I think you've raised a really interesting question that needs to be taken in some depth and spelled out as just what the outcomes are right across the spectrum of provision <coughs> and need, as it were, but also looking at what has been said very well here about those areas of learning, particularly the cognitive side, that we now need to promote and make sure are consistent. I think I would say, first of all, how do we measure quality in order to actually be able to measure the outcomes? Because quality means different things to different people, and outcomes also means different things to different children based on what their level and where they come from. And I think that's where we need to have a common understanding of quality and common understanding of outcomes. Amanda? Uh, like good teachers, I think we oftentimes backwards plan from what kind of opportunity and life chances we think all people deserve. And if you think about having a fulfilling life, then you have the opportunity to make the choices that will fulfill you as an individual. And then you take those all the way back to what that means when you're 18, 15, 11, 6, 2. Um, the critical thing is that you have access and you're, and you're prepared. Um, and I, I suppose if we think about primary and secondary schooling as your ability to achieve academically, to have high aspirations, um, and to access those opportunities that you want, um, I would just agree, we, ha we can't have a gap so I suppose the first thing would be to say that with however we measure those outcomes, those outcomes then need to be something that we expect as a baseline for all, all children at this age, and that they do go cut across the social, the well-being, the educational, uh, all those metrics, because those are all, a well-rounded person has those things. So whatever those things that help you to be ready at that age and help you access those things throughout your, kind of your life, okay. those are the outcomes. 
Uh, what, what, what do you want your children to have? I on think being leaving? at the Play-Doh face gives me a rather privileged position here in that I, I don't have to look at the metrics, I don't have to look at the data. The children come to me in September and one of them might not be able to talk at all. A good outcome for that child for me is them being able to communicate when they leave. They might make no progress in maths at all. And that hurts. That, that makes me sad. That makes me feel like I failed them. But they can communicate now. Maybe that is a good outcome. I, I don't have to nationalise that. I don't have to look across the whole spectrum. I have to look at one child who's my responsibility from September to July and decide what is good progress for this child. What is a good outcome? Because I might have to tick a box and I have to fill in the foundation stage profile, but come July I have to go to sleep at night and think I'm happy with that. And if I don't, it will keep me awake. I mean, we do have the early years foundation stage profile, which lays out what, what are the outcomes. I mean, I think one of the issues with it has been is that it's moderated in different ways and you know, measuring children of that age is very difficult. And I think that's, that's sort of been alluded to on the panel. I, for me, um, from all the, the evidence I read, you know, language and communication and the gap that we have at the moment and closing that gap it is a vitally important uh, outcome. How you measure it consistently, you know, the, a lot of schools do baselines when their children enter the school to see where they are and there are various things like Durham does a sort of baseline and we have the UFSP. Um, but I think, it, it, and Panima referred to quality and how do we measure quality? I mean, it's very, very difficult to put a finger on it actually. And I think one of, the, one of the advantages of sharing things like teaching schools is actually people being able to go to a, a school nursery or PVI nursery and saying, well, actually, what you do here is quite similar to what we do. It's not worlds apart. You know, what, what I know is the minister responsible is when I go in a good nursery, I can see it's good. <laughs> Defining that is, is slightly more difficult. Okay, well, on that note, can I just say thank you to the minister and our panel. Thank you very much indeed.